Hello and welcome to this next keynote video in the Doctor as Teacher series. My name is Johannes Streeten, I'm a GP trainee in South London and I've been invited to talk to you today about pedagogy or pedagogy. So before we get stuck into the content, let's just set a few learning objectives for today's video. So by the time we're finished, I would hope that you'll be able to compare and contrast some of the key points of the learning series that we'll be discussing. I'd want you to be able to explain to your peers what pedagogy is and the same for andragogy. And in relation to your skill of the week, I want you to plan a microteach using some of the concepts that we discuss in today's video. So let's start by talking about what pedagogy is. It's essentially a simple and as complicated as this, it's the theory and method of teaching and learning. And that's quite a broad statement to make. And it's a discipline which stretches all the way back to, um, to Socrates and ancient Greece. So we won't have time to go into all of the depth um, that pedagogy has to offer. But I'd like to focus in particular on one aspect of pedagogy in the learning series, because I think you'll see during this video, how that can be directly applicable to um, to your teaching and learning as medical students. If you are interested in taking a deeper dive into pedagogy, I'll include some links um, below about further reading that you can do to get a better grasp uh, of the subject matter. So let's start looking at these learning theories. The first one, which I think is important to know about, is the um, theory of behaviorism. So the behaviorists like Thorndike and Skinner were very interested in the process of learning as a product of stimulus and response. Essentially, if you deliver information to a learner um, with a high enough frequency and with appropriate reward or punishment um, when they get it right or wrong, then you can uh, instill that knowledge in that person. Behaviorists see learners very much as kind of empty vessels, which are just waiting to be filled with knowledge um, by the teacher who is the guardian of that knowledge and who delivers it to their learners. But it's an approach to education which um, has been broadly criticized because it really creates a dependence on the teacher um, and it reduces the ability of students to think critically about the subject matter. So when we're thinking about how you may have come across this approach in education, um, you might have been taught your multiplication tables in a similar way to this, just rote learning um, by repetition, um, what the times tables are. And I think that while it's very easy to approach multiplication um, from this perspective, there are much more creative ways to, to teach even things like that, which might seem um, appropriate for this style which would be much more engaging for students and would potentially give them a more concrete and useful learning experience. So behaviorism essentially gives us uh, a baseline to start from. And from behaviorism, we'll move on to talking about cognitivism. So the cognitivists were much less interested in the stimulus and the response, but rather what happened in between those two steps. So they were interested in the learning that takes place uh, in the mind. They were interested in how information is received by the learner, how it's processed, organized, stored, and then retrieved by the learner when they want to use it. And beyond that, they were interested in looking at how the learning environment and learning materials could be manipulated so that the learning experience was more useful and more productive for learners. So this might suddenly seem a bit more abstract than um, the fairly easy to understand classroom model that we talked about earlier. But essentially we're talking about the introduction of simple techniques like um, introducing a learning outline, uh, summarizing at the end of a lecture, and techniques like chunking, which I'm sure that many of you are familiar with in the context of OSCEs. So when we're delivering potentially complicated information to patients or actors in an OSCE type situation, we break down the information that we deliver. And every time we deliver a chunk of information, we then check with the patient to make sure that they've understood the information. And if they haven't, or if they want us to repeat it, then we can go back 
and either repeat it or we can explain it in a new way. So by trying to appreciate how people are learning and what learning process is happening inside the mind, we're potentially able to tailor the learning process so that it's more useful for the learners. This also means that the learners are much more involved in the process of learning rather than just being passive recipients of the knowledge. So I think you can see that that's uh, a step in the right direction um, as coming from behaviorism, but there is a way to go. So let's look at what came next. And that was constructivism and social constructivism. So the constructivists um, believe that you can't just take information from the environment and plant it directly into the mind. They believe in the idea of creating meaning from experience. And particularly in social constructivism, they believe the learning doesn't come from the individual, but from interactions between individuals, whether that's between peers, peers uh, and near peers, or between individuals and, uh, and educators or experts. It's within constructivist theory that concepts like scaffolding and the zone of proximal development were also introduced um, to educational theory. And we won't have time to discuss them in any depth here, but if you're interested, they're really key concepts and I'll give some information below as well. So again, this is a much more learner-centric um, and social interactive model of education. And if we think about how this relates to medical education, you've probably come across um, problem-based learning groups. Um, I know it's not necessarily a big part of education here, um, but it's something that you've probably experienced in some capacity. It also encompasses things like peer teaching and peer assessment, um, and even kind of OSCE groups that you set up yourself for practice or other exam groups um, would fall under this category. Another way in which constructivism is very common in medical education in particular is this model of apprenticeship that we use um, to teach young doctors. And this kind of experiential on-the-job learning um, is fundamental to constructivism. So constructivism is, is one of the more modern and in vogue educational theories, um, but we'll take it one step further um, and we'll have a quick look at what is known as connectivism. So connectivism deals not only with the use of technology and uh, interconnected technology to support learning, but it's also much more about social learning and self-directed learning by students. So in connectivism, um, learning is something which can take place anytime, anywhere, um, it's motivated by uh, the students' needs and what they need to learn at that time. It encourages students to seek out new sources of information and it forces them to assess the quality of that information. Uh, and then it allows them to synthesize information from, from multiple sources. In this connected kind of educational environment, teachers or educators become much more um, facilitator than a provider of the information. So the educators are kind of more on the sidelines, guiding students and assisting them in achieving their own goals. You may have also come across the concept of the uh, massive open online course and massive adaptive interactive texts, which seek to use technology, um, not just to deliver the same content to everyone, but to deliver a tailored teaching program um, through connected technology. So that's a bit of a whistle-stop tour through um, four learning theories, and there are certainly plenty more. Um, again, if you're interested in learning more about this, um, it's certainly worth doing some, um, some further reading, particularly if you're politically oriented. You may want to um, look up Paolo Fieri's Critical Pedagogy, um, which takes a very interesting slant on education. So let's leave learning theories um, there for now. And what I want to briefly cover is the other goji. So 
The main one that I wanted to introduce at this point is andragogy, and that's essentially the discipline which deals with adult learning specifically. So there's a chap called Knowles um, who came up with six andragogical principles, and I will briefly share them with you now. Just to give some background though, essentially he's looking at adult or mature learners as people who come to the table with uh, an entirely different mindset, different experiences and different expectations of learning. And as mature learners yourselves, I'm sure at some point you've experienced feeling potentially patronized by educational experiences, or perhaps just that you're not being taught in a way that you find particularly useful. And these six key points seek to address some of those issues. So firstly, Knowles realized that mature learners want to know why they need to know something. And if you can't justify why you're teaching someone something, then you probably need to ask yourself why you're trying to teach it to them as well. Self-concept is about um, accepting the fact that mature learners will want to take responsibility for their own learning and for the way in which they're learning. And experience is kind of, as it says on the tin, just taking into account the prior experiences and knowledge of the people that you're trying to educate. So skipping forwards, um, the next three, readiness um, is essentially the fact that um, mature learners will tend to learn things when those things are relevant to their current life stage. So as medical students, you will um, learn when you need to know something, whether that's before an exam or before a patient contact um, or before preparing a particular piece of work. So you want to know that the learning you're doing is relevant to a particular outcome. And orientation refers to the fact that mature learners are usually motivated, not just by learning a subject for the subject's sake, but because they're motivated to solve a particular problem or task. And finally, motivation just refers to the fact that extrinsic motivators like rewards, gold stars, grades, um, pay rises or job offers, although they seem lucrative at first, they're not particularly good motivators in the long term for learning. So it's about trying to spark internal motivation, perhaps by making learning self-directed or giving learners more control over the learning, um, you may inspire uh, deeper and more persistent learning. So I've included this one mainly just because it's even more unpronounceable um, than pedagogy, and I will leave you to uh, try and imagine how that's pronounced. There are actually multiple YouTube videos um, where people just spend hours trying to pronounce it. So um, if you get bored, have a go. But hertagogy um, is essentially uh, a much more self-directed style of learning um, that I suppose is a correlate of connectivism as an educational theory. So just to summarize what we've been through today, we've talked about what pedagogy is and we've compared it to andragogy. We've looked at four particular educational theories and we've looked at how those theories perhaps play out in your own lives as medical students and how you might apply them um, as young educators yourself. So moving on, I will include the skill of the week in the description below so you can find more information about that earlier, but essentially you'll be preparing um, or planning a micro teach using some of the information that we've talked about today. And if you want to ask any questions, uh, you can join Dr. Hearn between 11 and 11.45 for the Ask Me But Not Me Anything session later on. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you again.